Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy it's afternoon that we've had lunch because uh, research on uh, our parole committees shows that parole boards are far more amenable to granting parole after lunch. So I'm kind of hoping I'll be allowed to get out of here after this is over. Uh, but speaking of getting out of here, uh, I would like to uh, uh, take questions at the end of this. But I would also like to speak not so quickly compared to usually when I give a talk, I start really getting going. And uh, the talk ends nice and quickly, but no one can hear anything. So I'm going to try and slow this one down. And that means we may not have time for questions. And if that happens, you can just find me. And I'm happy to answer your questions. I can't promise the answers will be correct, but you know, I'll do my best. Uh, worst case, I can find someone else who can give you a possibly correct answer. So today I'm talking about Go's build modes. Uh, and these are the various build modes the Go compiler toolchain has when it creates binaries. Uh, and in particular, I want to talk about what they do and what you can do with them. Uh, several new build modes have been added in the last few years. Uh, so I'm hoping I can introduce these to you. Uh, so uh, that said, what is a build mode? Uh, and uh, the answer is a build mode uh, instructs the compiler to create a binary uh, in a particular way for a various execution mode, which is my way of punting the problem of defining build modes to talking about execution modes. Uh, so I suppose, you know, to not cheat, I should try and talk about execution modes. Uh, there are many ways of executing a program. Uh, my favorite, intuitively, not to use every day, but to understand, is an interpreter where you take a program, uh, and another program just runs through it line by line, looks at it, and does something. Uh, and you can see an example of this in the Go world with the, uh, the Go Playground. If you go to play.golang.org, that acts like an interpreter. In, in truth, it's actually built on the Go compiler toolchain because interpreters are not a very big part of our, our Go world. Uh, but it's a wonderful execution mode to try and understand. The kinds of execution modes we're more familiar with as Go programmers are ones where we use a compiler toolchain to produce a binary, and then we run that binary on operating systems. Uh, that, that covers actually several of the build modes I'm going to talk about today, and uh, hopefully we're all familiar with. Uh, there are other kinds of build modes, too. Uh, you don't have to build all of a program. You can just build most of it and have some other program do something with it. Uh, and I'm going to get to that towards the end of this. So here's, here's what I would like to cover today, eight build modes. Uh, these are all arguments you can pass to the build mode flag on the Go tool, uh, which instructs the compiler and linker to do certain things. Uh, and the first three are all actually, from the user's perspective, one build mode. And the reason I want to split them out and talk about them separately is that it's going to help us understand that uh, we as as users of the tool go build or go install or any of these commands, actually use multiple build modes in our day-to-day -day programming already, and that these new ones are just you know, adding features to these. So let me, let me start at the beginning uh, with uh, static executables. These are my favorite. Uh, these are the best thing the Go tool does. Uh, and a static executable is the Go compiler has produced a lot of object code. It has passed it to a linker, which links it into a big binary. And that big binary has everything in it. We can take it, and we can run it uh, on the operating system we, and the architecture that we targeted the binary at. Uh, and it's completely self-contained. The binary will make system calls to the kernel, and it will do this directly by using the system call instructions on the architecture. Uh, and there's no other part of the user space involved in your binary. Uh, and you've, you've had a static executable if you've ever written a little hello world program and typed go build hello.go, it produces a static executable. Uh, the reason why I specify the hello world program is because if you use the net or OS user packages, you didn't produce exactly this kind of static executable. You created something slightly different, which I'm calling for the purposes of this talk a different build mode. Uh, you can force you can force programs that use the net package uh, to be static executables like this by setting this environment variable cgo enabled equals zero at the top, uh, which is uh, why it's on the slide. Uh, so let's go on to talk about the net package, because it's pretty interesting. Uh, in particular, let's talk about a build mode, which uh, is a static executable with uh, libc. And what this is is uh, the compiler produces a lot of object files, and the linker 
produces a binary, and that, that one file contains all of the Go object code in your program. It contains the runtime, it contains your main function, all of the packages you use are in there. But uh, it has an instruction in the executable uh, for the, uh, the dynamic loader on the operating system to say, oh, by the way, link libc.so into this program uh, and link these particular symbols together to the Go code. Uh, and the particular symbols in question are DNS lookup symbols of get adder info or some libc equivalent of get adder info uh, and uh, functions for looking at users and groups on a system, which means traditionally on Unix means reading the password file in the et cetera directory. Uh, in practice in modern Unix, it means looking somewhere else. But the libc has lots of code for doing this. Uh, and a program linked this way uses that libc code. And the reason we do this is because it's very polite to uh, the operating system. It makes our Go program behave uh, the way the operating system expects. So if, you're, if on Linux you have a resolve.com file and et cetera, and if you, are, uh, if you have a particular DNS server in there with a particular proxy server that you want to use or some other uh, unusual network settings, uh, this executable uh, that uses libc will uh, do, the, do the expected thing with all of those settings because it just asks libc to do the work and libc does it the way a C program would. That's why goes toolchain automatically switches to using libc when your binary includes something like the net package. Uh, so we can take this a bit further. Uh, we, can, we can put more non-Go code into our program. Uh, and the traditional way to do this is with cgo. As soon as you start using cgo in a program, uh, the Go tool, as part of calling the Go compiler and the Go link, it will also call a C compiler. It will produce object code. Uh, and will then use the C linker to put it all together into one binary. And so we get one binary, uh, and we can run it, just like another binary, but there's non-Go code inside this thing. It's, uh, symbols that have been fleshed out by something that was provided to us by C or some other language. It doesn't have to be C. Uh, C just kind of... Often in this talk, I'm going to use C as a synonym for other. Uh, I'll try and be specific when I'm talking about C itself. So those are three different modes uh, the Go compiler has for... Uh, producing executables that all happen automatically. All of these things will happen when you type go build and then a package path or a .go file. Uh, it's done by looking at your Go program and making a decision for you. And they've been there forever. They've been there since Go 1 uh, before. Uh, and they work slightly differently on different operating systems, but the basic principle is there. Uh, so now let's, let's take this and move slowly into uh, one of the new build modes. Uh, and this is PI, Position Independent Executables. Now, you can take uh, a Go program you're going to build with go build something, and instead write go build dash build mode equals PI, and then something. Uh, and what comes out is an executable, a single, a single binary that you can execute, uh, and it works exactly the same way as your, your exe. Uh, nothing's, nothing's different uh, uh, to the user experience. So it's not really particularly interesting to talk about, uh, but it's actually kind of fun on the inside. Uh, what a PI binary has, uh, a PI stands for Position Independent Executables. Uh, and the reason why uh, uh, it's called Position Independent uh, is because uh, in a traditional executable, you'll often get something like uh, an instruction, a jump instruction, uh, that's like returning to the top of a for loop. And a linker, when it was laying all of this out, knows exactly where in memory uh, the program is going to be mapped. And so when it says, oh, I want to jump to the top of the for loop so that I can continue the loop, so uh, how will I do the jump? Uh, well, I know the loop began at uh, instruction 7, say. So what I'm going to do is just write jump to uh, memory address 7 up there. And this is a, a nice imaginary compact uh, machine language. Uh, there's usually a few more bytes in there. Uh, so that's great. We jump to instruction seven or instruction four or some other number. We, we specify an absolute position in our binary. Uh, and that, that's called position-dependent code. So your program is dependent on uh, the location of your code in memory. Uh, in a position-independent code, you never do that. Uh, and this is the compiler's job, is to generate instructions that will somehow uh, manage to reach, uh, uh, reach the top of the loop without ever referencing the exact memory location of the loop. Uh, and the way it does this, uh, is by using relative addressing to the location of the jump. So instead of saying jump to position four, if the loop was you know, 10 instructions long, it will say jump to the instructions, instruction 10 instructions before me. And that means you can put this code anywhere in memory 
uh, and this is a this is a uh, wrapped up in a security feature called address space layout randomization (ASLR), uh, which is something uh, that has been introduced in the last, say, about 10 years uh, to operating systems, uh, where each time an executable starts, it puts the executable at a different location in memory. Uh, and the advantage of this is uh, it helps mitigate security attacks, security bugs. So uh, if an attacker comes along uh, and somehow manages to modify a program through some kind of buffer overflow or something, it's, uh, uh, and they say, oh, I'm going to jump to a particular location in the binary, because I understand the binary, and if I jump here with the current state the way it is, it's going to misbehave in a way that's going to help me attack the program. Uh, if it's position independent and it's a different location each time, that attack doesn't work. First, the attacker has to work out where in memory it wants to, they want to go. And uh, that can be surprisingly difficult to do. So Pi is uh, uh, an interesting internal change to the way binaries work, but externally is completely the same. And in fact, on some of our uh, operating system targets, the go toolchain will automatically build Pi binaries because they're required for the operating system. So if you try and run an executable on an Android OS device, uh, it needs to be Pi for it to run. Uh, so that's what the toolchain does by default. Uh, in the future, I suspect all of our executables will end up being Pi, uh, and in the future, I mean 10 years from now, because changing operating systems takes a long time. Uh, so uh, we can ultimately uh, ignore this, but it's an example of uh, something different we can tell the compiler to do that will produce a different binary that does different things internally. And from here, we can sort of start to talk about other build modes that do things a little bit differently. So now I want to move on to C archive, C dash archive, or I just say C archive. Uh, which tells the uh, Go compiler toolchain to do something completely different. Uh, it takes your program uh, and produces object files, passes it to the linker, and instead of producing an executable, it produces a .a file. The .a file is in the Unix archive format uh, and is a traditional archive packaging format used by compiler toolchains for wrapping up a bunch of files, usually object files. And the point of this archive file is it has been designed specifically so that C, C++ C++ compiler toolchains can understand it. So you can take this archive file and you can do things with it. So I want to just work through some code for this. So here's a little program called hello.go, uh, and it's a main package, uh, and it's, it depends on cgo. So you can see there's an import capital C there, which uh, forces cgo. And uh, it's actually using uh, a cgo export directive. So if you're not familiar with cgo, this uh, comment export means create uh, a C function called hello and make this C function call into Go code and execute this Go function hello. Uh, and it also has an empty main function. It's empty because when we produce a C archive, the main function uh, is not used. Uh, it will not be executed by the program. So now we're going to write a little C program, and I'm going to try and keep the C in this talk to a minimum, because C, you know, it's a, this is a Go conference, not a C conference. Uh, and again, I would like to think of C as just a synonym but other than Go, but uh, in this case, the shortest and easiest example is DUC. So this C program has a main function, which calls another C function, hello. It doesn't provide the implementation of this hello function. It expects it to be declared in a header that's been included, uh, and expects something else to provide it. And so now if we put it all together, uh, we're going to build that hello.go file, and we're going to use build mode C dash archive. And what this does is it produces a hello.a file, which is a file prepared for a C compiler toolchain. And a hello.h file produces that too for you, which declares the uh, hello uh, uh, function. Uh, and then we're going to call the C toolchain, and we're going to give it the .a file, and we're going to give it the, the C file. And it's going to produce a binary for us, uh, this a.out. And we can run it, and it says, hello world. Uh, and so what happened here was we entered the main function of the C program and called hello, which came into Go and called fump.println. So here we have a case of uh, a piece of C calling a piece of Go, and all of this has been wrapped up into a single executable, a dot out, and it's all in there. Uh, but this executable was actually created by an entirely different compiler, uh, not the Go toolchain at all. The Go toolchain created an intermediate object that we passed over to C. Now, I'm going to talk through minimal examples of these and then come back and talk about when this is useful, or when it's not useful, why to put it together, mostly so that I can give you a, a sense of uh, the different kinds of build modes there are, and uh, it's seeing a minimal example I find extremely helpful for understanding what part goes where. And then we can start talking about uh, making decisions about how to write programs with these tools. So 
So the next one after C archive is C shared, which is extremely similar to C archive and yet entirely different. Uh, so what we're going to do is instead of producing a .a file, we're going to produce a .so file. And a .so file uh, is, SO stands for shared object, uh, and SO actually has many meanings. Uh, and for the purposes of working uh, between languages, uh, and especially with all of these build modes, is think of, think of .so as a container format of sorts. It's not, it's not quite a container format, but just because you have a .so file doesn't mean you know what you have. So specifically, we're going to produce a .so file that a C program can dynamically link to. And so, just to show some instructions we could run, we're going to take the hello.go file from earlier and the hello.c file from earlier, uh, and I'm going to uh, build the hello.go using c-shared instead of c-archive. And this is going to produce a hello.so and a header file again. And now I can link these, I can uh, invoke the C compiler, which the, the CC here is calling the compiler and then calling the linker. Uh, it's doing a lot of work for us. Uh, much like the Go tool does a lot of work for us. Uh, and uh, the C file here contains the main uh, function. The hello.so contains the implementation of the hello call that's going to be made. Uh, and it produces uh, a binary that we can run. Well, we can run. I mean, so you can see here that I've, uh, I've added this uh, environment variable, ld library path. Uh, and ld library path is, uh, uh, is the first hint that there's something kind of complicated going on under the hood here. And what's going on is that when you call, a, when you execute a, a program, the first, I look down here a lot because my slides are down here, in case you're wondering. I'm trying to look out at the audience a bit more, but uh, it's particularly helpful when I have commands to make sure I'm on the right page. So uh, the, uh, when you try and execute a, a binary on a, op, on a Unix operating system, particularly a modern one like Linux, uh, the first thing that happens is another program is run in your place, in your memory space, which is this dynamic loader. And it's the thing that actually does the work of finding your binary, pulling apart the header, working out what's going on, and then it starts putting pieces of things into memory, and then it starts your program for you. It actually finds your main and runs it. In fact, it finds things before main and runs those too. There's a lot going on here. There's this, there's this huge world of program that happens before our program. Uh, and LD library path is an environment variable that goes to that program. It's a program we don't like to think about very much because it's terribly complicated, uh, not a lot of fun. Uh, but all of, our, all of these sorts of build modes are based on this thing. So I'm going to sort of uh, delve a little bit into dynamic loading, dynamic linking. In particular, LD library path equals dot is saying add the current working directory uh, to the list of uh, places to search for .so files our program needs. And we have a, this hello.so file right here in this directory. Uh, and when a.out is executed, uh, the dynamic linker is going to find this, the so file and load it into memory with it. So this is very similar to earlier, but completely different. Because uh, earlier, the C compiler took the .a file, took everything it wanted out of it, implementation of hello, put it in the executable. Here, uh, all, of that, all of the contents of the so file are not in the executable. They're loaded as soon as you try and run the thing. If you delete the .so file and try to run this program, it doesn't work. So to try and like graphicalize this and put some nice colors on the screen, uh, uh, yellow is C archive and uh, pink is uh, C shared. And so uh, what's going on here is the executable that we produce uh, uh, asks for libc.so for C archive uh, and contains the symbols we need, main and hello. Uh, when we execute it, it loads lib.so, lib calls main, everything works. Uh, with C shared, what's going on is we, uh, we load libc, then we load hello.so. We only have main. Uh, we fill in the symbol hello from the .so file. So this, this sort of connection happens at the last minute. Uh, now, you know, why would you do this? Uh, the answer is there's several reasons why you might do this. Uh, one of them is you can do different things with the .so file. So here is a, a completely, here's a replacement for our hello.c file. And this is the last piece of C I'll show. So I'm, uh, I promise. Uh, and what this does is it uses some extra features of libc. Uh, that let us talk to the dynamic loader. Uh, in particular, it starts with this DL open function. Uh, and when we call DL open, we instruct, we're telling the loader, hey, I know you've done your work and you've started me and my, my program is running now, but I'd really like it if you do a little bit extra for me. Uh, if you could go and look in your LD library path and find something, uh, a library that does this hello thing for me, uh, that'd be great. And if you could give me back a handle to it, please do. Uh, and so DL open asks the loader to go and find hello.so and load it into my memory space. Now, part of my memory is this code. 
And now that I have this thing, I can, uh, at runtime, look into it and say, hey, can you find me a symbol uh, that I can use? Uh, this is DLSIM. So DLSIM finds us that capital H hello symbol that the Go tool generated for us. Uh, now that we have it, it's a function pointer, and now we can call it. So this program does exactly what the other hello program does, except that when we compile it, we don't need to know uh, anything about the, the artifacts created by the Go tool chain. You can compile this thing separately and bring the, uh, the binary and the SO file together later. So that's C archive and C shared. Now I'm going to talk about another build mode. And again, I'm running through these examples uh, to sort of give you a lay of the land, and then we can come back and talk about each one individually. Uh, the, next, uh, the next build mode is uh, build mode shared. Now, shared is not related to C. Yay, no more C. Uh, the shared build mode uh, bundles Go packages into shared libraries uh, that we can then dynamic, be dynamically linked by a Go binary. Uh, so there's some, there's some overlap with the words I'm using here uh, with what I was just talking about with C-shared. Uh, which is why they both have shared in their name. But importantly, this one doesn't have C in its name. So something else is going to happen. So let me give you the canonical minimal example of using this, which is we're going to create a Hello World program. And this is a Hello World program we've all written before with a, a main function and the, pr the print line inside the main function. Uh, now we can go run this thing. We can go build it and get an executable and use it. We can go build, build mode equals pi and get a position independent executable we can run. Uh, and we can do something slightly different. Uh, so what we're going to do now is first take the standard library and bundle it up into a, a shared object, a .so file. And we do this with this rather interesting command, go install, build mode equals shared, uh, std. Now there's a couple of things going on here. The first is I'm using go install instead of go build, which means, uh, importantly, the output uh, from this thing is going to be dropped somewhere else, not in our current working directory. Uh, and I'm using this std, which is not a package I have created. This is an alias for all of the standard library. And so when we do this, a .so file appears in our Go root somewhere, which contains all of the standard library in an SO file. So now that we've done that, we can just go build our hello example and use this extra flag called link shared. And link shared says, please build my thing, but go and find uh, the standard library wrapped up as a, as a shared object file and uh, link dynamically against it. Uh, it produces a binary, just like we would expect high, and we can run it, and it says hello. Uh, so the output looks predictable and understandable uh, until we start looking a little bit closer at it. If we, if we say, try to look at the size of our Hello program, it turns out it's 16 kilobytes, which is great. That's how big a Hello World program should be. Uh, but it's also a little bit surprising if you're a Go programmer, where our Hello World programs tend to be a couple of megabytes. Uh, and the reason for this is there's basically nothing in our Hello program. There's a little instruction saying, go find the standard library and then a, a couple of lines of object code for the main function, which says, now that you've got the standard library called thumbprint line, and that's it. Uh, and you can see this if we, if we use LDD, which is a Linux tool, which uh, can tell us uh, what, what our program will dynamically link against. You'll notice it links against Linux VDSO, which everything does because the kernel forces it. It links against libc because this is uh, uh, built as, uh, when we use this build mode, we imply uh, the libc mode we discussed earlier, and it links against libstud.so which is our, uh, our shared object file, which contains the Go standard library. And that thing's tens of megabytes. It's got the HTTP server and everything. Everything we don't need is in there. But it's shared. And this is actually the exact reason that C Hello World programs come out so small. When you compile those, those come out at like 16 kilobytes as well. Uh, and the reason for that is they link against libc somewhere else, which contains all the print instructions and all the DNS lookup code and all of that stuff uh, uh, that we can and compile into our, our Go programs as static executables, they dynamically link against. This is an example of dynamically linking against it just like C, which is why now our programs are sized like C programs, which is great. Uh, but it has the drawback that there's this .so file somewhere. You have to put it somewhere, and you have to make sure it's correct. Uh, you have to make sure your Linux is configured. Well, I'll go into that in a minute. But it's, uh, there's a reason we don't use this very often. The final build mode, all right, we're right near the end of the of me running through examples at a ridiculous pace. Uh, and the final build mode is build mode plugin. And this one's brand new, which means it probably doesn't work. But uh, occasionally, if you hold it just the right way, it works. Uh, and here's an example of it doing that. And what we're going to do is we're going to create an SO file, a different kind of SO file. Again, this is one of those things where we have one ending, and it does many different things. It's like .zip. Like, I mean, a .zip file might contain a movie or a text file or anything. Uh, it's just because you've got one doesn't mean you can put it to work. 
So we're going to create a plugin, uh, and I'm going to uh, use some ellipses here, just because otherwise my slides start getting a bit large, uh, because I'm going to create a package in a Go path. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this is because the name is quite helpful to have attached to the plugin. So I'm going to create a package my plugin. This is not a main uh, package like earlier. This is a, a package package, and it contains a hello function. So this is meant to be equivalent to the C archive and C shared we were building earlier. Uh, one key difference here is there's no import capital C, and there's no export directive for C. That's because we don't need them. We're going to have Go code call other Go code, and there's not going to be the C intermediary layer at all. All of the exported symbols from this package, uh, the functions and the global variables, are going to be available uh, to the program that loads this plugin. So now we need, all right, this is going to be our plugin. This is going to be our program that uses the plugin. So this is going to be a single file again, a package main. It's going to have a real main. Uh, and what we're going to do is call plugin.open, which is part of the, uh, the plugin package in the standard library. Look for my plugin. And then uh, once we have the plugin and we handle the error appropriately, because uh, it doesn't fit on the slide, uh, we're going to call lookup uh, and find the hello function. This thing uh, is, it comes back as an empty interface, uh, but it's an empty interface with the correct type, the runtime type baked into it. So it's a, it's a function. Uh, it's a func, and we can call it. Uh, and so this, uh, this will call our hello function. And so to put this all together, we go build uh, build mode equals plugin, my plugin. My plugin here is now a, a package path in our go path somewhere. And it produces uh, uh, a .so for us right in this directory. So my plugin .so. So now we can go build uh, run plugin.go, which has nothing special about it at all. Uh, it doesn't depend on the symbol uh, statically. It's going to look it up dynamically at runtime with those strings. And we can call run plugin, and it says hello world and exits. So. Uh, just for people who have program C uh, and want to see a connection to the earlier code, plugin.open looks a lot like dlopen, and calling the lookup method on the plugin that's returned looks a lot like dlsim. And in fact, those are used under the hood because that's how we can communicate with a dynamic loader on uh, Linux. There's no uh, IPC protocol for it or anything. Uh, so those are the build modes. What are they good for? Uh, let's try and talk about pros and cons uh, and things we can build. So. This is the list, again. The first three we know, and I kind of covered why they're different as I talk through them. Pi, I also kind of covered, but we can look at again. And the others are all completely different. Static executables, they're the best. There's no question. If I had to put these in a list, I'd put it first. In fact, I did. This is, this is how I like to program. If I try to solve a problem, I just assume this is how I'm going to solve it. Uh, until I hit a problem that causes me to do something else, I assume this is what I've got. It's one binary. It, it doesn't depend on anything in user space. It can be empty. Uh, all it depends on is the Linux kernel behaving correctly or the kernel of whatever op other operating system you're using behaving correctly. It's great in tiny containers. If you like deploying containers, you don't need to think about, did I put my libc in there or what other dependencies are there? Uh, and it works across Linux distributions that do things differently. It's terrific. You know, I can't think of anything wrong with it, except that we have all these other build modes for reasons. So libc, uh, libc is. Uh, Executables that have a libc link are the politest of programs, the politest from the perspective of the operating system, in that they are well behaved and behave just like C programs because they use a lot of C to get their work done. Uh, this adds a user space dependency. You depend on the libc being there. If you're going to do a DNS lookup with it and you want it to behave correctly, you have to have the resolve conf file in the right place. All of that depends on versions. Is it muzzle or is it uh, glibc? You, know, you, have to, you have to think about these things. In generally, though, you don't have to think about them very much, which is why the Go toolchain can do it by default. Uh, but it does add this small dependency, which is why we have this other static executable mode at all, because it's much, uh, uh, it's much more self-contained if you don't use libc. And we can go even further and add C. And you know, uh, we're going to use even more of libc now, because our C code is almost certainly going to malloc and free, which otherwise Go doesn't use, and all sorts of fun things. This is terrific for working with uh, a big blob of legacy code that you have sitting around. You have a C library and you want to use it, you can just get started right now. Uh, the downside is that C is not Go. Uh, and that has a couple of different elements to it being a downside. The first is now there's uh, uh, two programming languages in your binary. In fact, there's not just two programming languages, but there's this, not quite language, but complex semantics we use for communicating between Go and C. Uh, so now that all of the ways your, your binary can fail and all the ways that your Go programs can fail, that you know and understand. And all of the ways your C programs can fail. You can have dangling pointers and all sorts of fun things. 
and all of the ways you can uh, incorrectly communicate between the two. So everything is much more complicated with libc, but it's often, uh, it's much easier to get started if you have a giant C program, C library that helps with whatever problem you're trying to solve. Uh, and it can cost more down the line. So often the trade-off is a matter of maintenance against ease of getting going. With Pi, uh, Pi is just like, just like ESC. It should work just the same. Uh, in practice, right now, binaries are a little bit bigger, uh, which is kind of a bug. Uh, and there is this ever so slight performance cost in some cases, but that's a performance cost that basically everyone has decided to pay in return for the security of ASLR. Uh, and so, again, it's not really worth thinking about. Now, C archive, let's do something interesting. This is how we can integrate Go into an existing C program. And to give you an example of where we use this, this is how Go works on iOS. So we create a, a, a .a file from our Go code. Uh, we drop it into Xcode, and then we build an Objective-C program that calls C symbols in that .a file. That's, that's the meat of it. There's a bunch of tools in the uh, uh, in the mobile uh, sub-repository for gluing all of this together and uh, making, uh, making these calls a little easy. Uh, it has the downsides of working with C because you have these uh, cross-language calls. So everything that applies to using CGO applies to C archive. Uh, it also has this sort of interesting trade-off of uh, uh, you, Go is no longer in control of the final output. You've added it to some other build system. which almost certainly means something has become more complicated. But in practice, you probably already had this other build system. You had this big C thing that you were working on, and you, know, you wanted to add some Go to it. And so in practice, this usually isn't a, a problem with this approach. It's a, it's a nice thing. We can introduce a bit of Go on the side. Uh, C shared follows pretty similar rules. Uh, to give an example of where we use this, uh, uh, this is how Android apps work. Uh, we take the Go code we have, and we produce a, a shared object that can be loaded uh, by an Android app. Uh, and Android apps have a very... Uh, interesting start uh, initialization process. They jump straight into a big blob of Java code, and they basically have to if you want to integrate into the uh, app world of Android. Uh, and they have an interesting way of uh, actually uh, forking processes along with a lot of the logic already in your binaries. It's, it's quite fascinating. Uh, and then after they've done a little bit of work, you can use the Java uh, function system.load library, which is their version of DL open. Uh, and then you get your .so file uh, and start some Go code, and now you're in Go, and you can go for it. Um, just like C archive, this means we have cross-language calls uh, in Android. They're actually cross-language calls between Java uh, and Go, but they, they bounce through C to get there. So now we have all the fun of C and all the fun of Go and all the fun of Java uh, and managing two language boundaries at once. So uh, that environment's a lot of fun. Uh, the shared build mode uh, is probably the one I would expect uh, to be the least used in this room on the principle that as Go developers, we're generally developing binaries, programs for companies that we deploy either in the cloud or on physical hardware or something like that. Uh, and we don't generally develop a lot of binaries. We tend to develop just a couple, uh, or maybe just one. And uh, when we do this, there's not a lot of advantage in splitting the standard library out from our binary if we have just the one binary. Uh, where this does have an advantage is uh, it mimics the, uh, the traditional layout of a Unix operating system uh, where the packages each introduce as little code as possible, as little binary code as possible into, their, uh, uh, into the environment and everything's a .so file. And so this was actually developed by Canonical to, uh, for Go to work on Ubuntu just the way C programs do. It does have one interesting uh, uh, advantage for people designing operating systems, which comes up a bit uh, in my discussions around Fuchsia, I have, which is an experimental operating system, which is that if you have a lot of binaries written in Go, you can use this to potentially save RAM. So if we have two programs, and I use a lot of similar packages, and we're going to start both of these on a really tiny device, something with just megabytes of memory, uh, we have to load each of these programs into memory so that we can uh, execute them. And clever operating systems can page some of this out sometimes. But assuming that both of our binaries are actually active and in use and bouncing around through all of their code, this stuff's going to be in RAM. And with a Go program, uh, we have to load the program we wrote into memory, and we also have to load all of those standard library packages into memory. And when we have two programs, we have to load them both twice. Uh, there's, a co there's two copies of uh, the font object code sitting in RAM on a tiny machine which has two Go programs. 
Uh, with the shared build mode, uh, the font code is all out in this .so file, and a very clever dynamic linker or loader could share the same memory for both of these. Uh, it has to be clever. The one I have right now doesn't do it. Uh, but it is potentially possible, and so it's a sort of an interesting thing you could do. Uh, but again, I don't expect that to be relevant to anyone here. It's just kind of fun. It's also, uh, it's also a real pain. You, know, you, have this, you have these .so files everywhere. The versions have to match. You've got to deliver them somehow. You have to build a big package management system to do it. The people this is not a pain for are people who already have package management systems, like Linux distributions. The plug-in mode is going to take me a while to describe, and is really the reason I created this talk, was I wanted to come up with a reason why someone would want the plug-in package and then explain it. Because if you ask me, should I use plugins, the answer is no. Uh, you could then explain your situation, and almost certainly the answer is still going to be no. So uh, I feel like the only honest thing to do is to try and come up with why you would want it. Uh, and it turns out to be kind of complicated. Uh, so I'm going to work through a, uh, uh, a story uh, about a set of requirements for a company that lead them to use plugins. And this is inspired by a true story. There's a lot more politics in the true story and a lot of other unfun technical things that I've turned into technical problems, because that's just more interesting. So we're going to deal with an example application called a graph search service. And we're at some startup. They have really good coffee. Uh, they're probably really well funded. Uh, they have a few engineers, and they have a successful product. Uh, so we're going to start with that. We've already succeeded. Uh, and uh, what the graph search company, the graph company, who have this graph search service, owns a moderately complex data set. And this data set is in the shape of a graph. And their main product is a web page or an app or something. Uh, and they produce this page for you individually when you visit it based on doing a various graph traversal searches. Uh, so these are very heuristical algorithms that they've created that you know, dig through the graph and look for int information that might be interesting to you, find some things, then use that to infer the next one that they'll run, and they run as many of these as they can in the time they have to produce a result and put it on the screen for you. And they're successful. They have 100 million users, and they use something like 10,000 servers to serve this stuff out, and it's, it's a lot of work. And as I said, it's inspired by a true story. So uh, let me just continue to work through the existing environment they have. Uh, they have billions of vertices and edges in this graph, and there's just tons of metadata hanging off everything here. Uh, it's a big, complex data set. Uh, and it's, uh, after much work, they've managed to build this reasonably compact representation of the graph uh, that fits in about a terabyte. Uh, and it's growing nice and slowly. It doesn't scale linearly with the number of users or anything like that. They've got some you know, log linear growth or something. Uh, and uh, the traversal patterns are completely unpredictable. And the quality of the product is entirely based on doing as many as possible. The more information you can extract at the moment a query comes in from the graph, uh, the better the result is, and you know, the more money they'll make, and the happier their users will be. Uh, and as part of that, they fit the whole thing into RAM. They run these servers with a terabyte of RAM, which you can do, uh, and they run a process on it, and it's the graph search service, uh, and it responds to queries. And it gets a, good no a goodly number of responses per second, enough that they can scale their business. And they have this, they built this stable core product, and it's the source of all of their revenue. And it's really important. And they started as a tiny company of two or three people, and they're up to dozens of engineers adding features to this thing. And the features are all, they all trigger unpredictably. They're all based on the particular user who visits and what they might want. So a feature might only trigger one in a thousand times, or you know, one in a hundred thousand times. Uh, and are also, they also, all of these features need this graph. So that's where we are. And the problem these people have is that they're successful. They have revenue. Everything's going well. And they know that they can add more features and get more revenue, make people even happier. Uh, so it's a wonderful place to be. It's also a problem. It's a problem because they keep adding engineers. You know, they had tens of engineers. They had dozens adding features. And uh, soon they'll be at hundreds. Uh, and the problem is uh, sometimes these features go wrong, and the product breaks, and they have to roll back. Uh, and that's very expensive. They have this bi-weekly release process for this thing. Uh, and uh, uh, as they add engineers, the likelihood of the product breaking and needing to be rolled back increases, uh, which is a terrible state to be in. Uh, so what do they do? They, uh, they switch to microservices, because that's the answer. Uh, doesn't really matter what the question was. But uh, in this case, you know, it actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, microservices is not a place to go. You, know, you have a nice, stable server. 
uh, and it's going to make RPCs to the unstable feature servers that are pushed hourly uh, and owned by different teams. Uh, and the stable server will you know, try and get the RPC back and uh, incorporate the result. Uh, it looks something like this. Uh, and uh, if they incorporate the result successfully, yay. If they don't, they just drop the unstable feature and serve the stable product. Wonderful. Problem solved. Uh, well, problem solved. This, this works. Lots of companies do this. Uh, the problem here is you know, each feature has to load, a, each feature server has to load a terabyte of RAM, a terabyte into RAM. So each of those feature servers is consuming an entire computer. Even though they're probably very rarely triggered, especially early on when they're rolled out, ops probably only turn them up to you know, a fraction of a percent. Uh, and so suddenly we have a stable server and dozens of feature servers involved in serving a single user. Uh, and we're consuming dozens of terabytes of RAM. Uh, and so now we've, un we've disconnected uh, the, uh, the problem where the number of engineers grows, uh, the, the, the productivity slows. We've, we've successfully detached that, but now we're at a place where the number of engineers grows and the amount of memory used in production grows. So our, our costs get higher. So uh, what can they do? Uh, they could put features in plugins. And you know, I say this reluctantly. Uh, but you know, it's something you could try. You could have a stable feature server that's constantly repacked every hour into an image that gets deployed to all of the machines. Uh, and the plugins are constantly rebuilt. The feature server binary is stable. Uh, and as, the, as the, uh, the service comes up, it asks some control server, what plugin should I try running? It tries starting those things. Uh, if everything fails, some watchdog uh, separate service or perhaps thread, uh, sends back a message saying this didn't work. A request comes in, it causes the machine to fall over. Uh, the central management system watches uh, and says, turn off that plugin, it's broken. Uh, and the advantage of this is the plugin is loaded into the same memory as the, uh, the main stable feature server. And so the graph it traverses is the same terabyte of memory that the main thing runs. Uh, and we can slowly ramp these things up or down without growing the amount of RAM. And it looks a bit something like this. These are uh, very straightforward things. Uh, all of this has drawbacks, of course. Uh, we have to build out as much infrastructure as you would have to build out for microservices. So I talk about this plugin ops server, which is doing some of the work of an ops team, but it has to be automated because it has to respond quickly. If a plugin starts causing servers to fail, it has to immediately uh, make sure that when new servers come up, the plugin does not get loaded or else the whole system will fall over. And someone has to build this and maintain it and test all the edge cases. There's some central config file everything uses. It has to be right. Uh, there's, there's a lot of moving parts here, and you have to build these from scratch. There's no microservices packet. You can't use GoKit. You can't use gRPC or anything to help you with this. Uh, you're on your own. Uh, but it does solve the problem. So you might want to use plugins. Just uh, to sum up very briefly, uh, uh, we have a bunch of build modes. They're mostly. Uh, Things that have been produced by, uh, well, besides Shared, which was produced by Canonical for exactly their need, most of the build modes have come about because of some need someone has, uh, and they, they have just enough expertise to implement it. Uh, uh, and it's very much sort of side work. Uh, there's no team dedicated to these build modes to make it all happen. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of work that could be done with these, a lot. And hopefully someone will do it. Uh, and the bulk of that work is just about uh, increasing the number of operating systems these build modes work on. Right now, C Shared is limited to Linux. It should work on Windows. Someone is working on it. There's a bug. I haven't followed it recently, but uh, uh, they've, they've worked through a lot of issues. Uh, no one's working on the macOS support for it, but you know, it can totally work on macOS. Shared could work on macOS if someone wanted it. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the use would be there, because, uh, but maybe for integrating into Homebrew or something like that. Plugin should definitely support macOS, and I should probably do that sometimes. Sometime. It should probably also support Windows, uh, and someone should do that. Uh, also, plugin uh, needs smaller binaries. Right now, it's, uh, it's the minimum implementation. It tends to have multiple copies of packages lying around. It could be a lot tighter and a lot more efficient. All right, that's build modes.